Golden Gate gig was an important one. The Golden Gate, we just drove past there. That's like, when we got that we got signed from this show. It was the first one where there were lots of music industry people came along, and I remember it was only a five song set. Brothers and Sisters, Bigger Stronger, Ode to the Ode, Careful Where You Stand, Shiver. Fantastic. Short set. But it was really, really good. They played really well that night. I was just a guy, an amazing guy called Simon Williams. The label was in uh, Fifth Hand has been going for about um, five years, and our quest has been just to put out new records by a new band. They had their own gig nights, which we still do to this day, actually. The, first, the one in January was called Pandemonium, and it was basically five nights. The Bull and Gate is the absolute definition of the toilet circuit. I mean, I went in there once uh, during the afternoon, in, and it really does smell like the gorilla's cage at London Zoo. It's great, you know, and it's, it's kind of weird how how venues that create their own culture and, and there's something about the Bull and Gate that just means that it's constantly new bands. You know, that, that early rush when you're getting those first reviews and you're getting on the radio and stuff like that, you know, it's, it's, it's the best part of any band's career and it must have been brilliant. Have you seen the caption on the picture before that? There it is. Mm, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> Look at that combo. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let, let, let me just point out that at this time, you know, we, we were very new to the world, you know. I, I only just got to London, I didn't know anything. My outfit is just one of innocence. I think, uh, I think, I think the March gig would have actually been the launch for the single. I think that would have been the single, which I think was a single release party. It couldn't be any more indie, you know. It was literally about, you know, a man walks into uh, Camden Falk and finds bands playing great songs and asks them if they want to do a one-off single. That was it, no strings attached. I think it was about, I think it cost us 450 quid and was probably the best 450 quid I've ever spent. I think January, they were first on and there was a real A&R frenzy and then March, they were headlining and we knew the gig was going to be sold out and actually full of every single major label A&R man in the country. I mean, it did happen, once it happened, it happened quickly, but when it didn't happen, it took ages. You know, for those first few months, the major just wouldn't buy it. This band's absolutely brilliant. There's some really good people involved, you know, you know, devs and people like that. We've got a band with, you know, virtually an entire set of brilliant songs for the first album. I think you know, the only thing that was missing then was probably Yellow. I mean, they just they looked at Chris and thought, and he's got crazy Leo Sayer hair and he wears a tank top and he made cracks toast between songs. And you don't do that if you've got an acoustic guitar, you know, if you want to be the next Bob Dylan, you don't have a laugh, do you? I mean, what changed for them was radio. They got onto the radio and Stephen Mack loved it and then Joe Wiley loved it and then they got the momentum and off they went. <laughs> 